שבוע טוב, ladies, ברוכות הבאות, and welcome to another edition of our Torah classes. And whether you're logging on to ohelsara.com, to Torah anytime, or if you're a YouTube subscriber, thank you so much for always being such dedicated followers and students of Torah. Kedosh Baruch Hu should bless you, keep you safe from harm and protected, and always give you the ability to be inspired by Torah, but more than that, to have the yearning to continue to learn. It is now Motzei Shabbat in Israel. We just finished Shabbat, beautiful, beautiful Shabbat, and we are now beginning Purim. So I wanted to share with you a beautiful, beautiful lesson in honor of this joyous, miraculous, and holy Chag. Wanted to offer you some Divrei Torah. But before we do, I have to say some thank yous because you guys have been incredible, incredible. As you know, Purim is one of the highlights of charity giving of the year. And all of you have been really, really pulling us through. And I, I appreciate it so very much for every single one of you who has been donating to the Perm campaign, whether for Torah hours, which we'll go through very soon, Torah hours, which I love when I see that, Torah hours, the mikvah, helping needy families, my rabbi, thank you so, so very much. So please answer amen to the following people, and then we'll continue. For the refua shlema, the speedy recovery of Dalia Batalis, as I said, the 65-year-old woman in progressing stages of cancer, Shem should send her speedy recovery. The refua shlema of Yaakov Yishai ben Naami. The refua shlema of Yohanna Wank Miller. The refua shlema of Yehuda ben Rivka, a 20-year-old boy who was in a terrible accident. He needs a speedy recovery. For the speedy recovery of Etlin Bati to Pearl, Aharon ben Chava and Sarah bat Etlin, you should all have speedy recoveries. Be'ezat Hashem be'karov. For the ilui neshama, the elevation of the soul of Moshe Aharon Alter ben Yosef ben Yamin, alav shalom. For the ilui neshama of Sarah Dina bat Elimelech, alav shalom. For the ilui neshama, the elevation of the soul of Asha Rose. Margaret, the daughter of Lydia, her memory should be blessed. Uh, she was such a blessing to many of her students. She was an amazing teacher. Shem should give her an aliyat neshama. Answer amen, please, for the health, success, parnasa, sustenance, and many blessings for Yariv ben Tzivia. Should be matzliach in parnasa kala b'shefa. Devora Sarah. Bat Anna Rose, David Ben Etlin, Pinchas Ben Etlin, Pinchas Pinchas Ben Chana, Chana Bat Sarah, Miriam Elisheva Abrams, and also Eliana Leo Abrams. The Kadosh Baruch Hu should bless him with all the good in the world. We have three beautiful dedications. One from Chaya Elgart, who wrote when she donated that she's dedicating it to all the Jews in the world who are unfortunately experiencing divine concealment and who feel lost and disconnected from Hashem and their people. May they see Hashem all around them and know that he loves them. Thank you so much, Chaya Elgart, for that beautiful uh, dedication. Also, Nathan Alcantara. Really, thank you so much for the dedications to the Chayalim, to the soldiers of Eretz Yisrael, and that they may see beyond the Hester Panim, the divine concealment. Migrate Lurero, dedicated to every woman out there. So listen closely, you ladies. She wrote to every woman of all ages, to the tireless and constant dedication to their husbands, children, families, and friends, especially to everyone who donates. That's what she wrote because it inspired me to do the same. Thank you, and thank you, Migrate. Special mention to Brenda Ehrlich, who, when she donated, wrote in the memo, thanking me for all the lectures that I've been giving. I, it warms my heart when you guys do something like that. Thank you so, so very much for the 
recognition. I truly appreciate it. Thank you for all those who have been donating to Torah Hours. Thank you to Catherine Gerwitz, David Wiseman, Dixie K. Pring. 300 hours of Torah, Aura, Zafiro Polis. I hope I said it right. 300 hours of Torah, Shana Willems. 300 hours of Torah study. And also spreading of Torah, promoting of Torah, maintaining of Torah. Thank you to Paula Snyder, Sherry Friedman, Lotus Elgart, Stacey Quizan, Diana Kian. I hope I'm saying this correctly. 500 hours of Torah. Thank you, Diana. And Nevada Berg, a thousand hours of Torah. Wow, wow. As you can see, you brought a smile to my face. These are the kinds of donations that I love to see. And thank you to Samiha Matin for the donation that you gave. I'm sorry that you didn't include an email. So thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. So thank you so very much to all of those who have been donating in honor of Purim, ladies and those who are listening who are not ladies, who are men. Um, you don't even know how important it is to give on Purim Day, tonight, tomorrow. Break the record now. Let's go. Donate, donate, donate for Torah hours, for the mikvah. Uh, 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 to needy families for Purim Bezat Hashem, to my rabbi's congregation, Torah hours, Torah hours. You don't know how important that is. You just don't know how important that is to continue to spread Torah. Torah. So those of you who haven't yet had an opportunity to donate, or those of you who have donated, it's still so important to give on Purim itself, even if you give $5, but it's so important to donate. You know what to do. Just log on to ohelsara.com, click on the donate button, you, um, actually, if you log on to olsara.com, the Purim um, logo is right there. You can log on to there and you're all set to go. As I said, it's now Motzei Shabbat, the beginning of Purim. Very soon, we are going to go hear the Megillat Esther. And I wanted to provide you some words of chizuk as you're preparing for the Chag on the other side of the world, maybe you're driving somewhere, delivering Mishluche Manot. I wanted to offer you some words of Torah that you can hear in honor of the holiday. You know, all the holidays that we celebrate, like Pesach, Sukkot, Rosh Hashanah, they all make sense and they're all very meaningful. They're uplifting and inspirational. And there's actually an order to these Chagim. But then we have this one holiday, this one Chag called Purim, which is total chaos and madness, if you think about it, because the house becomes a wreck. The men look atrocious in their drunken state. There's the traffic that you encounter as you're driving and delivering Mishluche Manot. So how does this day fit in with what we as Jews are all about? Because basically, we have a holiday where we have 24 hours that are wild, drunk men everywhere, craziness and a mess in the house, traffic everywhere, singing, dancing. How is this in any way what Hashem wants from us? How is this good? And is this a Jewish ideal? How do we explain this? How do we explain the mess on the floor and the 700 packs of wafers? How does that make me a holy person? Can somebody explain that to me? Tonight, we are going to redefine Chag Purim, and hopefully we'll have a greater appreciation of what we're accomplishing on this very auspicious day. We are going to understand why this day is so powerful, meaningful, and important, specifically Dafka, because it's chaotic. Now I have a question. Do you feel proud to be associated with other Jews or not. There are times we feel very proud to be Jewish, especially when we hear about all the corruption in the Gentile world. And we say, oh, wow, look how crazy society has become. Baruch Hashem, thank God we're Jewish. Thank God we have a Torah. Thank God we follow a, a moral code of values. But then there are times where we hear stories like the story of Bernie Madoff or some big rabbi involved in corrupt activities or maybe even some religious person behaving 
in a disgusting fashion. And it's at those moments where we feel that Jews are not so different than everybody else out there. And we're embarrassed from the Chilul Hashem, from the desecration of Hashem's name that they created. That's when confusion hits and we wonder, should we be proud to be associated with the nation called Am Yisrael or not? Is this something unique about us or are we really just like everybody else? Today, we are going to understand who we are and what it means to be a Jew by discussing the story of Purim. Now, we all know the story and I'm sure many of us think that it's an interesting and an important story for all generations. But there are people who think that the mefarshim on the story, the commentaries on the story of Purim are a little exaggerated. And I'll give you an example. The Rabbanim tell us that Mordechai, alav shalom, was so great that he was like Avraham Avinu, alav shalom. And some even say he was as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. Alav shalom. Now wait just a second over here. I understand that Mordechai was a great man. But he never spoke to God. He wasn't considered a formal Navi, a formal prophet. He was not the founder of the Jewish nation or the one who gave the Jews the Torah at Har Sinai. How could you ever say that he's as great as Avraham Avinu or Moshe Rabbeinu? How could you even compare Mordechai to Avraham or to Moshe? Not only that, but the Rabbanim tell us that during the time of Purim, and Israel fully accepted the Torah. Can someone explain that? We know that Am Yisrael were threatened with annihilation, so they were obviously afraid. And what did they do? They gathered together, they fasted, they repented, and they prayed to Hashem to save them. And you're telling me that they accepted the Torah on a greater level than the Jews at Har Sinai, at the revelation of Sinai? What is this? I mean, doesn't that seem a little exaggerated or a little overrated? I mean, we understand that what happened in Persia was an incredible story, which took place within a matter of a few weeks, because from the time the decree against the Jews was distributed in the 127 provinces of Ahasuerosh until Haman was hung was just a matter of a few weeks. So it's an amazing story. But how is this story so powerful? Not only that, but Chachamim tell us that when Achashverosh removed his ring and he gave it to Haman, that act was made public to all the Jews. And it was so powerful that it affected them much more than all the warnings and all the prophecies of all the Nevi'im, of all the prophets combined. You understand what the Chachamim are saying here? The fact that Achashverosh removed his royal ring and gave it to Haman, that act was more powerful than all the warnings of our holy Nevi'im in Jewish history combined. To some people, these commentaries sound somewhat exaggerated. So we have to try to understand this story. And once we redefine the story, we're going to understand the questions that we're asking a little better, and we'll also understand what it means to be a Jew. Hopefully, you'll also understand why Purim is such an amazing and inspiring day, as chaotic as it could get. And because it's as chaotic as it is, it's so special. And in this class, we are going to learn why. We'll begin with how the Jews are described in the Megillah. They are called Yehudim. Interestingly, there's no mention of the word Yehudim, which means Jews, in all of Tanakh, in all of the canon of biblical literature. Later on, yes, in Sefer Melachim Bet, the word is mentioned, but even then it's not referring to the Jewish people, but rather the residents of Malchut Yehuda, the kingdom of Yehuda. Throughout Tanakh, the Jewish people were always referred to as B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, or just plain Israel. But in Megillat Esther, it's the first time that we're referred to as Yehudim. Why is this the first time that we are called Yehudim, Jews? 
Someone once showed me an article in a secular newspaper quite a number of years ago that actually made me feel very proud to be Jewish. At that time, the article stated that there were 14 million Jews in the world, 7 million in America, 5 million in Asia, 2 million in Europe, and around 100,000 in Africa. Now, just so you understand the comparison, for every Jew in the world, there are over 100 Muslims. So we're at the rate of, a, of one to 100. And, and even with this ratio, one single Jew is more powerful than all those 100 Muslims combined. And the author of that article provides us with some facts. He writes that Albert Einstein, the genius and most influential Jew and scientist who was voted by Time magazine as the man of the century, was Jewish. The greatest psychologist of all time, Sigmund Freud, was Jewish. Karl Marx, Paul Samuelson, and Milton Friedman were all Jewish. The man who created the polio vaccine was Jewish. The man who invented the drug the ba that battles leukemia was Jewish. The man who created the vaccine for hepatitis B was Jewish. The man who won the Nobel Prize for infectious diseases was Jewish. The man who won the Nobel Prize for neuromuscular transmission was Jewish. The man who thought of cognitive behavioral therapy was Jewish. The man who invented the idea of a pill was Jewish. The Nobel Prize winner for the mastery of the human eye was Jewish, as well as, as, well as the man who came up with the idea of embryology. He was also Jewish. But wait, the article isn't over. <laughs> the man who created the dialysis machine was Jewish. Over the past 105 years, the Jews won a total of 180 Nobel Prizes. How many did the Muslims win? Three. Let's continue. The article stated that the man who created the microprocessing chip was Jewish. The man who thought of the nuclear reactor was Jewish. The man who made optical fiber. The man who invented traffic lights the one who invented stainless steel, and the guy who taught us about the sounds of music, all these men were Jewish. The inventors of the microphone and the video recorder were Jewish. The men who owned Ralph Lauren, Abraham and Strauss were Jewish. The owners of Levi jeans were Jewish. And there's more, the article continues. The man behind the Starbucks conglomerate is Jewish. The guy who owns Google is Jewish. The man who runs Dell Computers is Jewish. Donna Karen and some of the most famous designers are Jewish. You read this article and you start to feel proud to be Jewish because you say, oh, look at all these powerful people and they're Jews. Look at what it means to be a Jew. Other religions don't have the ratio we do. I mean, we're only 14 million people in the entire world at that time that the article was written and look what we've done and accomplished. So doesn't that make you proud to be Jewish? Maybe, maybe, but in truth, this has nothing to do with why we should feel proud to be a Jew. The reason why we should feel pride in being Jewish is because we are going to look at the first man to ever be called a Jew, and he's the one who will make us understand what it truly means to be a Yehudi, a Jew. The Pasuk in Megillat Esther states, Ish Yehudi haya b'shushan habira. There was a Jewish man living in the capital city of Shushan, Ushmo Mordechai, and his name was Mordechai. Mordechai was the first person to be referred to as an Ish Yehudi. He was the first man to be called a Jew. Why? I'm going to explain some aspects of the Purim story that I'm sure you already know, 
but I'm going to explain it to you from a different perspective so that you get an idea of what the story was truly all about. And then you'll understand why the story of Purim is so special and why Mordechai was considered so great. You're going to understand why this is the first time that we as a nation are referred to as Jews, as Yehudim. You'll also get an idea of what it truly means to be a Jew, and then you'll be able to appreciate the Purim story properly. Since the time that Am Yisrael became a nation, until the story of Purim, the Jews were living in Eretz Yisrael, in the Holy Land. And what that means is that the person that you interacted with usually was another Jew. Your fellow Jews were the people on your block that you spoke to, that you shopped with, that you carpooled with, so to speak. Those were the people you bought from at the local market, those were the bus drivers and the sanitation workers. Everybody you ever saw was Jewish. Of course, every now and then we'd, we'd have to deal with the enemy who was not Jewish, but generally speaking, for 900 years since we became a Jewish nation living in the Holy Land in Eretz Israel, we were barely challenged by any Gentiles living together with us. So we felt strong and powerful because we had our own country. We had our fellow Jews as neighbors, the society was Jewish, and we pretty much all followed the God-given laws. And being an Eretz Israel meant that we were experiencing what it meant to be a part of the nation called Yisrael. But sadly, we sinned terribly, and that caused Hashem to destroy the Bet HaMikdash. And for the first time ever, the Jewish people were no longer in their homeland. My dear friends and students, never in their history as a people living in the land were the Yehudim, were the Jewish people ever outside of their land. Never did they have to live with people who were not Torah abiding Jews, let alone Gentiles who despised them. So when we were exiled from Eretz Israel, we believed that we were no longer what we were. And we thought that we no longer had the power that we used to have, nor the strength of character. So what happened as a result? We decided that we needed to be different. Many Jews consciously made the decision to ease their way into the Gentile society. Why? because they felt that they were no longer considered a special people. And that meant that they'd have to adapt to a more humble demeanor, to kind of lower their heads in the exile and assimilate into the culture that they were now in. And you should know that it was a big deal that the Jews attended Ahasuerus' party, his banquet, and that they ate there because it demonstrated the new philosophy of Judaism that many Jews sadly adapted. It was the new philosophy of what? If you're a Jew and you're not in your homeland, if you don't have the same comforts that you used to have, then you better obey the laws of the new land and attend the Gentile king's feast. Not only that, but when you leave that party, don't forget to bow down to the evil Haman because you are now a nobody. And he has now become the great, mighty, powerful right-hand man of the king. If you're not in your homeland anymore, how can you even dare to think that you're not going to attend the banquet of the Persian king? I mean, who do you think you are to make your own decisions? After all, you are now under somebody else's rule for the first time in your history since Egypt. You have no other choice but to obey the authority and direction of your new rulers. And that's why, sadly, almost every Jew attended Ahasuerus' banquet. And that's why they bowed down to the likes of Haman. They did it because that's what they understood being Jewish was all about at that point in history. Unfortunately, that mindset hasn't changed. Today, many Jews think that they have to assimilate and to be part of the culture and society that they live in. 
The entirety of the Jewish people changed at that time long ago in Persia. In their minds, they assumed that this was the correct decision because they thought that if they'd be in their own country and if the Bet HaMikdash was still standing, then of course they'd have the right to walk around with their heads held high and project the reality of who they really were, which is Bnei Israel, the holy children of Israel. But as far as they were concerned, at that time in history, in the Persian Empire, they thought Bnei Israel were now gone. That nation no longer exists. They weren't in their homeland anymore. They didn't have a place they could call their own. And in their minds, they decided that that meant that they don't have the power they used to have. They're not as special anymore. But then one man, an Ish Yehudi, a Jewish man, came along and said, you're gravely mistaken. You know what Ish Yehudi means? Chachamim tell us that in the word Yehudi, which you see on the screen now, the letter He and the letter Chet can be interchangeable. So Mordechai wasn't just an Ish Yehudi. He was an Ish Yehidi which means he was a Jewish man, yes, but more importantly, he was a distinct individual, a Yechidi. He was a man who understood and thought, I don't care where I am. I don't care if I'm in exile under the rulership of a Gentile king. I'm still unique. I'm still a Jew. Although I was forced to be under someone else's authority, I am not under their power. I can still walk around feeling very connected to the truth. I can still dedicate myself to my ideals, to my morals, and to what I believe in. Mordechai was the first person ever to be challenged in this way. He was the first person to be thrown out of his country, still believing that he was special and that Am Yisrael was still and indeed unique. He thought even though the world isn't treating me in an honorable manner anymore, even though my Gentile neighbors don't agree that I'm special, although the government and the people above me may not con concede to my uniqueness, it doesn't matter because I think so. Ish yechidi haya b'shushan habira. It was an individual, a powerful and unique man who understood what he was and who he was, no matter where he was. But guess what? No one else understood this. No one. And if you think about some of the Jewish people we heard about in the past few generations, you'll see the power of the yachid, of a, of a unique individual. I'll give you just a few examples of people who had the attitude and the spark of the ish yachidi, the singular man. Take, for example, Reb Moshe Feinstein, Alava Shalom, who came to America and understood what it really means to be Jewish. It didn't matter to him what the streets of America looked like at the time that he emigrated. He adhered to a higher calling. And in the middle of the Lower East Side of Manhattan, he created a center of Torah. What about Reb Aaron Cutler, Alava Shalom? He came to the city of Lakewood, New Jersey, when there were no yeshivot or any kind of Torah learning. There was nothing. It was a barren desert of spirituality. There was only him. He too came to Lakewood with the same understanding and belief like Mordechai HaYehudi. Mordechai HaYechidi. He had that feeling inside of him of, I am a Jew, and it doesn't matter what everyone else thinks or how they choose to treat me. I'm an ish yechidi. And all by himself, with his own two hands, Rabarn Cutler built up the Lakewood community to a giant center of Torah learning. He built the yeshiva that today houses over 5,000 talmidim, 5,000 students. If you would have told Reb Cutler in the 1950s that the yeshiva is going to house 5,000 students in the future, he would have thought you're crazy. 5,000 students? But look at what one man accomplished. 
Rav Ovadia Yosef Alav Shalom understood what it means to be a Sephardic Jew. When there were no yeshivot or Torah centers in Eretz Yisrael for children from Middle Eastern backgrounds, he helped build schools and organizations that helped the Sephardi world get back up on its feet. He didn't care if everyone is driving around and sporting new cars. He didn't care what the people are doing on Yom Kippurim in Eretz Yisrael or what they're choosing to eat or how others are celebrating their Pesach. He didn't care what the Ashkenazi world at that time thought about the Middle Eastern Jew. He understood what it means to be an Ish Yehudi and an Ish Yechidi. There were great people who understand what it means to be an individual. Let me tell you a story about one man. Now, have you ever been to a, a Rebbe wedding? Uh, the Hasidic weddings are not typical weddings, especially if it's the wedding of the Admo, the, the great rabbi. The average religious wedding, we'll say, has about between 200 to 400 guests. But a Rebbe wedding has 10,000, sometimes even more in attendance. And that's not an exaggeration. They put up bleachers and everybody stands on the bleachers and they participate. But you should know that when World War II ended, it wasn't like this. The Hasidim suffered a great loss. And by the time the war was over, they were reduced to almost nothing. But the famous Satma Rebbe Rabiol Teitelbaum, Alava Shalom, a few weeks after World War II, found himself in a DP camp in Switzerland. Before Shabbat, he told his Shamash, his helper, the following, he said, could you do me a favor and try to find for me a strimal and a gartel? A strimal was the special uh, furry hat that the Hasidim wore and the special belt. And this Shamash told the Rebbe, Rebbe, <laughs> Shabbat is coming. Our entire world was just turned upside down. Everyone we know is dead or crying. Is this really so important now? And the Rebbe said, I'm asking you to please get me a strimal and a gartel. So the Shamash went around looking for these items. And would you believe he actually found them? That Friday night, the Rebbe was walking around the DP camp with his long coat, a gartel, and a tall, beautiful strimal. He was walking around like that. And the Shamash, his helper, was walking around broken, tired, and with tattered clothing. So as people stared at them, the, the shamash turned to the Rebbe and he said, Rebbe, everybody is staring at you. And the Rebbe said, they're not looking at me. They're looking at you because you're the one who's not dressed the way a Jew should be dressed on Shabbat. A Jew must present himself in a princely fashion on Shabbat. And that's the pride that we have to hold on to. Wow. The Satma Rebbe was an Ish Yechidi, and he didn't care what the world thought or how they behaved. He understood who he was and what was inside of him. Now, if you look at the word Yehudi, which means a Jew, it has the letters of Hashem's name in it. How? Well, let's see. We have a, of a, we have a Yud, we have a He, and we have a Vav. And all we're missing is the letter He. So if you take the letter Dalit in the word Yehudi, and then you add the letter Yud in the name in the in the name Yehudi to the middle of the Dalit, that creates the letter He, which then completes Hashem's name Yud K Vav He. So you know what a Yehudi is? A Yehudi is a Jew who walks around with God inside of him. It's a Jew who has pride in the fact that he's a Yeresh Amayim, that he has a heavenly reverence. During the story of Purim, only Mordechai Yehudi understood what being a Jew really meant. He understood that although we're not in Eretz Yisrael with a built Bet Migdash, we are still Yehudim. And that means that we don't bow down to the ideals of other nations. We don't submit to the immoral ways of the secular world. We don't give in to the temptations of the society that we're living in. 
We're Yehudim. And that means that we are Yechidim. We are singular and unique. But what I want to know is who was the first person to refer to the Jews as Yehudim? You know who it was? You're not going to believe it. But the first person to call us Yehudim was none other than Haman. If you look in Megillat Estelle, you'll notice that the first person to refer to us as Jews, as a nation, was Haman. And that's very significant. You know why? Because there's one group of people out there who know who we are more than we do. And that group of people is our enemies. Our enemies understand what it means to be a Jew. And how do we define a Jew? Well, ask Haman because he got it right. <laughs> he understood that a Jew has God inside of him. He understood that we're unique and that we stand alone. He realized that a Jew means he's a Yechidi. He's singular because every Yehudi has God's name embedded inside his soul and in his body. Remember that article that listed all the names of the Jews who made great achievements in the world that I read to you in the beginning of the class? You know who wrote that article? A Muslim. And you, would you believe that after he lists all the great Jewish achievements, he spends the rest of the article wondering why the Muslim world cannot achieve what Jews do? He wondered how the Jewish people, who are so few in number, are able to reach such great heights while the billions of Muslims are achieving barely anything. The point is that this Muslim who was looking in from the outside understood what the Jewish people are and what we can be. Haman also understood that. He knew what it means to be a Jew and the importance of being a Jew. Mark Twain also understood what many of us don't. And he wasn't necessarily a lover of Jews, but he understood what a Jew is. In his famous essay titled Concerning the Jews, he wrote about Judaism and anti-Semitism. Let me read to you just a few lines from the article that was published in 1898 in Harper Magazine. Listen to what Mark Twain understood about the Jewish people. And I quote, I dare say that for centuries, there has been no more quiet, undisturbing, and well-behaving citizen as a class than that same Jew. It seems to me that ignorance and fanaticism cannot alone account for these horrible and unjust persecutions. A person who has for untold centuries maintained the imposing position of spiritual head of four-fifths of the human race and political head of the whole of it, must be granted the possession of executive abilities of the loftiest order. In his large presence, the other popes and politicians shrink to midges for the microscope. I shall allow myself to use the word Jew as if it stood for both religion and race. The Jew is not a disturber of the peace of any country. Even his enemies will concede to that. He is not a loafer. He is not a sot. He is not noisy. He is not a brawler nor a rioter. He is not quarrelsome. In the police court's daily long roll of assaults and drunk and disorderlies, his name seldom appears. That the Jewish home is a home in the truest sense is a fact which no one will dispute. The family is knitted together by the strongest affections. Its members show each other every due respect and reverence for the elders is an inviolate law of the house. When he is well enough, he works. When he is incapacitated, his own people take care of him and not in a poor and stingy way, but with a fine and large benevolence. His race is entitled to be called the most benevolent of all the races of men. The charitable institutions of the Jews are supported by Jewish money and amply. The Jews make no noise about it. It is done quietly. 
In benevolence, he is above the reach of competition. In a population of 48 million, of whom only 500,000 were registered as Jews, 85% of the brains and honesty of the whole was lodged in the Jews. In estimating worldly values, the Jew is not shallow, but deep. With precocious wisdom, he found out in the morning of time that some men worship rank, some worship heroes, some worship power, some worship God. If the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but 1% of the human race. Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be heard of, but he is heard of. He has always been heard of. His contributions to the world's list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, and abstruse learning are also a way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in this world in all the ages and has done it with his hands tied behind him. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? This is how the secular world sees the Jewish people. They see the Ish Yechidi, the singular individual in the Ish Yehudi, in the Jewish man. Esther Malka sends a message to Mordechai saying, Lech, Knosset, call ha Yehudim, go and gather all the Jews. What is she trying to tell Mordechai? Megillat Esther contains many firsts. It's the first time we were exiled from Eretz Yisrael. It's the first time a man is referred to as Yehudi. And it's the first time where it's documented that we gathered as Jews. Esther asked Mordechai to go and gather all the Jewish people. You know what that means? It means take them out of their societies, bring them out of their low self-esteem, make every single Jew realize that he's a Yehudi, make every Jew realize what it means to have Jewish pride, because it's not just you, Mordechai, who's the Ish Yehudi, the singular person. Every single one of them are Yechidim. They're all individuals. They all possess God's name inside of them. Every one of them has a Jewish heart, and you have to make every single one of them believe it. At that moment, when Mordechai gathered the Jewish people, Hashem gave him the strength of Avraham Avinu, because Avraham was the only person who stood alone against the entire world. Mordechai also received the strength of Moshe Rabbeinu's leadership because Moshe was the only leader who elevated the entire Jewish nation. And Mordechai, just like Moshe Rabbeinu, gathered the Jewish people and made every single one of them believe their Jewishness. And that means that we live and adhere to a higher order, that we have greatness inside of us. This is the first time and it's unbelievably the first moment that the Jewish people were Jewish because they chose to be. For 900 years, they went with the flow and they were happy because they lived in Eretz Israel and the Bet HaMikdash was standing. They identified themselves as Jews because everything about the way they lived was Jewish. From their neighbors to the mode of dress to the marketplaces that were owned by Jews. But then when they were exiled, everything changed and they began to assimilate and to become part of the cultural society that they were now living in. In the story of Purim, it was the first time since they were exiled where all the Jews gathered together without a Bet Migdash, without the holiness of Eretz Yisrael. The only Kiddushah, the only holiness they possessed was the holiness that resides inside of them. This was one of the first times since their exile that they realized what a Jew possesses inside of him. We finally understood what Haman understood we all possess. 
And every Jew at that gathering understood and learned that profound lesson. It's the first time that we weren't just being Jewish, but rather chose to be Jewish. We chose to live like true Yehudim. We chose to live like individuals who have Hashem inside of them. So you know what makes me proud to be a Jew? Not Karl Marx and not Albert Einstein, certainly not Sigmund Freud. What makes me proud to be a Jew is that every time I talk to another Jew who has Torah inside of him, I feel like I'm being given the opportunity to see how that Jew understands and feels that he has a Shem in his heart. Almost every woman I've come in contact with cares about her connection to Hashem, to Judaism, and is trying to do what is right and just in the eyes of Hashem. How many mothers do I speak to who say, I'm trying to find a way to inspire my son so that he should remain on the right path? That mother understands what it means to be a Jew. What about those people I speak to who, unfortunately, experienced multiple tragedies in a short amount of time, and they're falling apart financially, but they still have such faith and trust in Hashem. Those people understand what it means to be a Jew. When I speak to divorced women who are older and they can't seem to find their new marriage partner, they believe that their situation is all from Hashem and they have faith in their future. These are women who understand what it means to be a Jew. When I speak to a teenager who's struggling and says, you know, I'm tempted to do all kinds of things that my friends are doing, but I'm trying so hard to be different than them and to be good and to do what Hashem wants. That teenager knows what it means to be a Jew. When I speak to the young married women who are negatively influenced by their neighbors and they tell me, you know, in my circle of friends, the mode of, dre the mode of dress is not the most modest and the shaitals are shameful. But I don't want that for myself and I don't want that for my family or for my husband. I want to attend more shiurim and I want to learn more about Torah and what Hashem expects of me. I want to be a beautiful Jewish wife and a, a wonderful mother according to the standards of Torah. That woman chooses to be an Isha Yechida, to be an individual Jewish woman. So I want to tell you something that I, I, that I had a hard time understanding. You know, there are a lot of things that the rest of the world is involved in that goes against Torah values and ideals. And some of us know people who do the same things that the rest of the world does, unfortunately. That's the truth as hard as it is to hear. Now, we can understand how somebody can become addicted to drugs or how a person can drink excessively. We can understand why people gamble and why they cheat in their business dealings. There are many things that are understandable, even if they're wrong. But there's one thing that the world does that I have a hard time understanding. I don't understand why people get tattoos. Can you explain to me what goes on in the mind of a person who wants a tattoo? Does he say, you know what? I'm a nice, big, strong, athletic man. So I'm just going to sit in this chair over here and make myself ugly. Explain to me the idea of a man engraving on his body pictures of dragons, maps of other countries, a portrait of his girlfriend who he's probably going to dump. I mean, we think it's crazy, right? But do you know that 43% of the men in America between the ages of 25 and 50 have tattoos and 36% between the ages of 15 and 25 have tattoos? That's more than a third of the teenagers in America. Now, tattoos aren't something you find on some, just on some random truck driver. It's all over the place. And even women are getting tattoos. I once saw a picture of a bald guy and his entire head was filled with tattoos. He had long knives and dragons and names of people and phrases on his head. Does anybody have an explanation for this? I mean, I have no idea why a person sits under a needle and says, paint me forever. Do you have an, uh, any understanding of this? 
Why am I telling you this? You know what's interesting about it? Because we all know fellow Jews who unfortunately became addicted to drugs and to alcohol. We know Jews who cheated and were dishonest in business, sadly. But how many boys who grew up in a yeshiva setting and have not gone off the path of Torah have tattoos? Almost none. A Jew who's strong in his Torah learning and observant observance of mitzvot, who is not a Baal Tshuva, a convert, or who went off the path, a Jew with Torah that's alive inside of, inside of him understands that he's greater than that, that even though he's going through a rough patch of life, even if he's having a tough time, inside of him he feels that he's a Yehudi, and that he's part of the Am HaYechidi. He knows that he's a holy person with a holy neshama. He doesn't need pictures of dungeons and dragons to feel like a man. He's already an Ish. He's an Ish Yehudi. Now, there's a, a famous story about Rabbi Lazar Silver, who survived World War II. Rabbi Silver was one of the chaplains who went around to various DP camps to try and rejuvenate the Jewish people after the Holocaust. <coughs> one day, he went to a DP camp and he heard that there was a Jew there named Simon Weissmandel. Simon refused to attend any of the prayers or inspirational gatherings. So Rabbi Silver decided to approach him. And he said, you know, I hear that you're disgruntled and you're not happy with God. And this Simon guy said, no, 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 Rabbi. It's not that I'm unhappy with God. I'm unhappy with one of his servants. And the rabbi asked why. And Simon said, well, when we were in the concentration camp, there was one Jewish man who managed to smuggle in a sidur, a prayer book. You know what he did? He took that sidur and he told us that if we want to use it, if we want to pray from his prayer book, we have to give him a quarter of our daily ration of bread, a quarter of our daily food, just for a few minutes to use his sidul. Could you believe that he did that? How could a Jew stand there and take a quarter of people's food away from their starving mouths? You're going to take away the food of people who weigh only 70 pounds and you're going to eat their food and make them give you their food so they can pray? And Simon said, Rabbi, there was such a long line of men waiting for that guy's sidur. Can you believe all those people were willing to pay with their food in order to use that prayer book? And Rabbi Silver said, you're right. What this man did was atrocious. But you're looking at the wrong half of the picture. Instead of concentrating on that one Jew who did a horrible thing, why don't you focus on the dozens of Jews who waited online despite how crushed they were? They were willing to give up their daily bread weighing only 70 pounds just to be able to pray to Hashem from a sidur. Am Yisrael is amazing. I have yet to find a connected Jew who doesn't own a little bit of Yehudi inside of him, who doesn't possess a little Kedusha, who doesn't have a little bit of holiness of what Mordechai possessed. Mordechai changed the target of the entire nation. And that moment when he gathered all those Jews, it was the first time we chose to be Jews without any external benefits. We didn't have a Bet Migdash. We didn't have a country to call our own. We didn't have the Kohanim. We didn't have the Levim. We had nothing. All we did was gather together as Jews, as unique individuals who believed and understood what we possess inside of us. And every Jew has that inside of him. And you know when you have an opportunity to see it very clearly? One day a year on Purim, 
tonight and tomorrow because Purim is the day that half the Jewish men are drunk, you know, and may very well be one of the most expensive of Chagim besides Pesach. Because if you think about it, between the Mishluchem Anot, the, the care packages, the tzedakah, the charity, the decorations, the wine, the costumes, the meal, the Megillah, Purim is an expensive, chaotic and wild day. But that's when you get to see the truth of what resides inside a Jew. How? How? You see, on Yom Kippur, it's very easy to be deceiving. There are many people who suddenly show up to, to the synagogue on Yom Kippurim, to shul, and they all of a sudden they put on a nice suit, they, they wrap a talit around their body, and they sit there davening, praying and fasting, and they appear very holy. Anybody can fake his way through Yom Kippurim, but you can't fake your way through Yom, Ki Yom Purim. Chag Purim, why? Because Purim demonstrates what we possess inside of us. Purim shows us that with all the chaos and all the traffic and all that spending and people drunk, we're still acting in a holy way. Purim is the one day a year that you get to see and feel what it means to be a Jew, and I'm going to prove it to you. On Purim in Lakewood, New Jersey, practically the entire town is drunk, and that's not an exaggeration. Well, guess what? The police of the town of Lakewood say that they find it amazing that although the entire town is tipsy and chaotic, they don't receive one call complaining about a fight that broke out or some massive disruption, not one call. Thousands of Jews are in venahafahu mode. They're in like this upside down mode. And yet we see the spirituality of godliness pouring forth from those young men on that day. Amid all that chaos, the mess and the wildness we can see through the Jew on that day and we could recognize just how much of a Yehudi he truly is. This day was monumental because this was the day when the Jews in Shushan redefined themselves. This was the day when the Jews decided to become and to live like Yehudim. This was the day when Mordechai stood up and he said, I'm an Ish Yehudi. This was the day that he gathered all the Yehudim, a characterization that was defined by our own arch enemy Haman because he understood what it means to be a Jew more than we understood at that time. And Purim is considered the day when we reaccepted the Torah because we chose it from our own free will without anyone forcing us or manipulating us. And that was more powerful than all the Musar, all the rebuke, of all the prophets combined, because all the Nevi'im were pretty much just preaching to the choir. Why? Because they were talking to people in Eretz Yisrael about Eretz Yisrael. So that's simple. But over here, this was the first time that we were forced to identify ourselves and understand what it means to be a Jew outside of the Holy Land. I want to add something before we conclude. Have you ever been in a house on Purim where six yeshiva guys come jumping in and they start dancing in the middle of your living room and they blast the music and they, they, they do it because they're asking for charity? Were you ever frustrated by that? I mean, we saw this happening hundreds of times where some of those guys uh, can unfortunately, if they're tipsy enough, regurgitate all over your clean floor. And if anyone else outside the Jewish religion was looking on, you'd say, what are those guys doing barging into the house like that? This is crazy. The secular world says that because they don't understand what we know. They don't know that so many of those young boys spend the entire pouring day roaming around from one Jewish house to the next in order to collect charity. For who? For themselves? No. Not one of them is collecting money for himself. They're busy collecting for the yeshiva, 
for their Torah institutions, or for poor people. That's a Yehudi. That's what it means to be a Jew. So yeah, they act a little crazy because they're tipsy. But on this grand day of celebrations, these boys are celebrating for the sake of someone else. And after Purim is over and they manage to get back to themselves, they all sit together counting the money that they collected for the yeshiva. And they start to distribute the funds that they collected for those in need. That's what this day of Purim is all about. It's about seeing what and who we really are and how powerful and great this day is. This is a day that if it's celebrated the right way, it could be holier than Yom HaKippurim because so much more can be accomplished by being authentic. You know, there was once a rabbi, a chaplain, who worked on an army base in Texas during the Korean War. This rabbi used to counsel all the soldiers who saw their fellow friends die in war. At one Friday night, the rabbi was in his room and a Jewish soldier came running in. And in his hand, he had three letters. And he said, Rabbi, I, I don't know what to do. I'm so nervous. And the rabbi said, what's going on? Why are you so nervous? And the soldier said, I'll show you. I have one letter over here that says I'm being called to duty to go fight in Korea. Then I have two other letters from my parents, Rabbi. You have to understand, I'm an only son of two elderly parents that are not well. If I have to go fight in the war, they might get worse. In fact, I have a third letter here, one from each of their doctors saying how dangerous it's going to be to their heart and to their future. So Rabbi, can you please do something for me? Please do something for me. Get me out of this mess. So the rabbi looked at the letters and he said, you have to understand that, that the country is at war right, right now. You don't just get to change your mind. I can't just, I can't just you know, snap my fingers and get you out of this mission. The young soldier persisted and he said, Rabbi, please, I need your help. So the rabbi agreed to help him. The problem was that the general who made these decisions was on the other side of the army base, six miles away. And it was Shabbat. So the rabbi woke up very early on Shabbat morning, took the letters with him, and he walked six miles to meet with this general. He walked into the general's office, sat down, and he presented his case. The general stood up and started yelling at him, Rabbi, this is wartime. What kind of request is this? That is impossible. You're crazy. He was so angry that he took the rabbi literally by his lapels and he wanted to throw him out. But then he noticed that on the lapel, the rabbi had a little stone carved out like the Ten Commandments. So the general said to him, Rabbi, you see this thing? You see this stone, these Ten Commandments? They were engraved on stone because stone doesn't break. The same thing is true concerning the rules in the army. They're on stone and they don't break. So go back to your barracks. I'm sorry, but this is not even a question. I'm not going to change the protocol. The rabbi was a little shocked, but he understood. As he began walking out of the office, the general said, wait, chaplain, where's your jeep? And the rabbi said, I don't, I don't have one. The general was shocked. He says, what do you mean you don't have a jeep? So how'd you get here? And the rabbi said, I walked. It's our Sabbath. The general was flabbergasted. You mean to tell me you walked six miles just to help this soldier? And the rabbi said, of course. The general was so moved by this that he said, you know what? Sit down, sit down. He picked up the phone, got the colonel on the phone, and he said, Colonel, I have something to speak to you about. And he proceeded to speak to him and explain the soldier's extenuating circumstance. And then he told the rabbi, Rabbi, I'm requesting that he should be transferred to the New York City base. And I want you to give him strict orders that every single night he has to visit his two elderly parents, because he's not going to Korea. Good day, Rabbi. You can walk back to your barracks. 
the rabbi proceeded to walk back in the Texas sun for six miles just to save another Jew. My dear friends, when people see what we possess inside of us, when they see how much we care about each other, when they see what it means to be a Yechidi, a single individual, and a Yehudi, and a Jewish singular individual, they understand, and they start to realize more than we do what it means to be a Jew. On this upcoming Chag now that we just entered into, you know what we're celebrating? We're celebrating us becoming a renewed nation, us choosing to be a nation. So when you venture out on this Chag and you're giving out your Mishluchem Ano to your friends and you're also distributing money to the needy and you're also donating to Oha Sara, while you're dancing and you're happy and your kids are enjoying, you should understand what you're celebrating. We are celebrating a day that can be greater than Yom Kippurim because we're celebrating something that we cannot fake. It's very real. Don't look at someone like Bernie Madoff, the one person who didn't understand what it means to be a Jew. That guy failed. Look at the rest of the line of people waiting to give and to sacrifice because they understand the truth of their essence. My dear friends, there's so much opportunities that are waiting for you tonight and tomorrow, and even Monday, Shushan Purim. Log on to ohelsara.com. Click on the Purim donate button and donate for whatever cause you feel you want to give to. We really need your help, and we want you to show how much you care for this organization, for people in need, for Torah, for hours of Torah, for the maintenance of Torah, reach out to us. On this day, our true essence is revealed. On this day, we receive the most prestigious title ever given. We were called Yehudim. That means that every single one of us is an Ish Yehudi, and that makes us an Ish Yehidi, singular individual, and an Am Yehidi, a singular nation. Iratzon, maybe so, that each of us recognize the greatness of the Jew inside of her. And from that place, we should serve Hashem and be a positive example to the rest of the world of what true and moral values are, of what serving God is all about and what caring about others means. May this Chag bring with it bracha, blessings, atzlacha, success, sason, happiness, simcha, joy. And miracles. Amen, Ken. Yehi Ratzon.